haters be flying, but I'm flying too. They feel that they fake, now I't got a clue. So many nuts with them, and I swear it's true. Never let they ever consume you. They told me to give up and just start trying. They won't mess with my thoughts, man, I swear in lying. God said I'ma be a star, which I start shining. Just working ahead of me, this the perfect timing. Snakes in the grass, but it feel like I'm all broke, cause I can't find them. All this pain I'm feeling, and it got me blind. Hi everyone, my name is Dunsi Strohsheim and here with me today are Drs. Alex and Joke Onojego. Joke and Alex both have PhDs from the UK and they currently reside in Canada. They are here to share their stories, their accomplishments and experiences as Africans living abroad. I am so excited to have them here today because they do have very rich and powerful stories. So Joke and Alex, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. So tell us about yourself, what you do, and how you are impacting your local community. Do I go first? Yes, go first. I am a senior remote sensing specialist and a data scientist. Um, I have a PhD in geography, but um, I found some love for data science along the way. And I have continued to do that. I work with um, an environmental management firm here in Edmonton as a remote sensing specialist. And on the side, I also do a lot of music. So I direct music in the community. And that's a brief summary of myself and then Alex. Yeah, um, we're actually in the same field. Um, I just special data analyst. My background is actually in surveying and photogrammetry. Um, got some geoinformatics on the side there too. Um, we actually work um, in the same firm here in Edmonton, an environmental consultancy outfit, and um, lots of GIS data analysis and playing with satellite data. Um, in terms of um, background, um, yeah, that, that, I think that's about, about it there. So what's it like to work together and for both of you to have PhDs? That must be interesting. Oh boy, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> it's it fun. could be fun. Yeah, but um, I always tell people that um, she's my greatest critic. And um, yeah, we love to banter. So yeah, we've been working working together for quite a while. We actually started working together way back. Um, so so 20, 20 years. 22 years. 22 years now, yeah. Was the first time. It was first time. I was doing a one year um, industrial training. And I was in six months. And he came in to do six months. And that's, um, yeah, that's when. Yeah, when so I was when... technically the first on the scene yeah, <laughs> in that yeah, um, yes. company yeah, in so, Lagos. Yeah, so, so yeah, we, 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 we know how to place professional life and family life. So that's, that's actually key. That's a key, key secret. So we know when to leave work behind and focus on family. So you need to have a good balance. Fun, fun, fun. So. Tell me uh, about any unique family history or background that otherwise we wouldn't know. Um, I come from a family of musicians. So the seven of us either sing or play. My brothers and myself play at least one musical instrument. And um, I'm also a descendant of the current um, ruling house in Lagos. Yeah. How about Alex? Oh, my, I, I don't think people know much about this, but. Um, I'm actually from a royal family, um, so my dad's my dad's um, a royal prince um, from in Delta State, and yeah, not many of my friends know that part about me. So yeah, I tend to put it under the under the bonus if you know what I mean. Yeah. So how long have you been in Canada, and why did you decide to relocate to Canada? So uh, for me. Anyone who knows me well knows that despite all the vices in Nigeria, I am one very proud Nigerian. I love being Nigerian. It comes with these challenges. And one of the challenges is that um, every time you fly with a green passport, you are randomly selected, very conveniently randomly selected, irrespective of the number of visa stamps from all the so-called high profile countries that you've been to. So it happened a few times and um, one of the most embarrassing, they had me come up, did some patting around everywhere, told me to pull up my dress and all. And I felt so humiliated 
because I we had had the opportunity severally to decide we were not going back to Nigeria and we were moving on. My husband had always wanted to move. And I was like, I prefer it in Nigeria. I really don't want all that racism thing going on. So those things, and then the fact that Canada has a very beautiful summer compared to the United Kingdom helped me decide that I would go with Alex's vision of migrating. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, I've always had um, a passion um, to actually relocate to Canada even before I met my wife. Um, and um, I think you get to a stage in life where you have to tell yourself the truth and accept things the way they are. Um, we were based in Nigeria in the past, after which we moved to the UK to study. And um, getting back to Nigeria and given the sort of profession we're in, we're into academia back in Nigeria, lecturing in university, you come with a renewed zeal and a passion. And unfortunately, sad, it's not appreciated. Um, you tend to make suggestions. Also in the private sector, um, there are certain things that um, you don't expect to be the norm, um, but unfortunately are viewed like a misfit. I think that's the word. And yeah, it came to a point and I said to myself, and we said, as a, agreed as a family, um, that there would be opportunities in looking for alternatives. And we spoke, we thought of Canada, we have family down here and um, they actually wanted us to come. Yeah, so they yeah. were on our case for a yeah, long they, time, yeah, for years. Yeah, yeah. So we, <laughs> we actually had a conference in the States um, that was 2015 and we decided to come to visit um, Canada and got in, loved it. The people were warm. People were really warm compared to where we're coming from when so UK, compared right? to the uk yeah yes, yeah, right? yeah so um we had two visits and during that period um we were able to look at the pros and cons and there were lots of advantages yeah um, including the, um, better health care the, better health care um it's more immigrant friendly um there are lots of opportunities if you know what you're doing um and the people are very welcoming so those were some of the key factors and drivers that actually you know made us to um take that bold step to relocate to canada and also to think of the life of our children going forward that's a central theme that has been coming out of this discussion so i'm so glad to hear about that that canada is actually a nicer better place especially for african immigrants but that being said there are challenges so what are some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in Canada? In terms of challenges, I'll, I'll say it's, um, it varies from people, from, from individuals to individuals, right? Um, so um, one of the key things, particularly um, migrating down here is um, the way things are done. So uh, one, one of the courses that we took um, before coming down actually focused on trying to adapt to the Canadian culture. So it's way different. Um, things like um, how do you prepare your resume? Um, how do you network soft skills versus hard skills? Um, how do you present yourself the place of having empathy for your colleagues at work? You know, things like that um, compared to um, the mode where you're coming from, where you, it's more of hard skills. I can do X, Y, and Z. And um i don't necessarily have to ask you how your kids are doing and stuff like that but down here that's important there should be a very good balance between your work life your professional life um but in it all i think the key that has actually helped us is a place of being prepared um so during our previous visits we took out time to actually review um how the workplace is like given our field um, what are the standards? Um, how do we have to structure our resume? The sort of networks you should belong to. So there were lots of things that we had to do. So it, it took a lot of personal research on our end and also trying to understand the Canadian workplace and also the people and then integrate that, integrate into it smoothly. So um, lots of personal research and trying to do additional courses also um to build our capacity to be able to fit in 
So yeah, I think that one of the key things is actually being prepared. One of the challenges was assuming that your degree is enough. So we come from, from a background where it is expected that um, once you have a master's or you have a PhD, a job is guaranteed. But that's not the norm around here because Canada has a very high percentage of graduates because the immigration system brings in people who only have degrees. Of course, you have the semi-skilled and all. So there are so many of us who come in with degrees, but you don't have to um, show your worth in many ways. Like I had to learn to put up practical things of what I'm able to do online and then put that in my resume. Like the first job I got with the university, what helped me stand out was um, a visualization that I had done and then put up online and then networking with people like you, you know, who had been um, here for a while. So one of the challenges is that we tend to make assumptions that um, Canada isn't that different from anywhere else. But in reality, it is. The kind of things that are taken as priority, for example, in England, isn't so much of your priority here. And then the second challenge for me was um, having to deal with people who assume that every African has a degree, but isn't necessarily skilled. So yeah, I have my degree and I am skilled at it, but I, I had to sort of go the extra mile to show. I've had people at work, for example, assume that because I'm black, I really don't know much. And you know, because my accent isn't Canadian as such, there are assumptions that people who sound in a particular way don't have a particular skill set. So I had to find ways to showcase my abilities beyond my apparent appearance or beyond what I look like physically. That's very true. You have to take time to prove your worth and um, basically let them know the value that you bring to the company or to the organization you want to be part of. And um, you know, try to build your capacity, like I said earlier, that's really, really key. Um, don't assume your degree is enough. You have to build on that. Look at certain things in your industry and the industry you're interested in and what sort of trainings do I have to go through to make myself relevant. So you have to be relevant and that means you have to take courses. That means you have to take time to read. To and you study, have to network with the right network people. Network with the right people, be the right <laughs> places. And um, that's that's just basically it. Not So at times, just forget about your degree. That's your foundation. Back to both of your points about the Canadian versus the UK culture. Um, could you expand more on that? I can sense that you prefer the Canadian culture, but I'd like to learn more about the um, UK culture. What are the things you like or you disliked about the UK culture? And what are the things you like about the Canadian culture or don't really like about the Canadian culture? That's, um, that's a very sensitive topic. <laughs> okay, so if you don't want to, that's fine. If no, you don't want to talk about it. It's good to speak about it. You know, uh, yeah. yeah. So like the British don't like you um, coming into their personal space. Hmm. You know, the fact that I said hi to you at work doesn't mean I'll see you in the market square and I have to say hi. Yeah. Well, wow. here in Canada, I don't have to go into a long discussion with you in the marketplace. But I could at least say, oh, hi, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good day. Okay, have a good one. See you on Monday at work. But in the UK, that, that's such a rare thing. And mm -hmm. it's not because they don't like you. It's just the, the way they are, you know. And we come from Nigeria where, ah, I can't saw EABC, you know. We try to interact. Yeah, in fact, we do it. We overdo it in Nigeria sometimes. So for us, it was like a shock that we, we had to learn to mind our businesses outside the work environment. So we found Canada to be a hybrid of what Nigeria is and what England is. Yeah, and um, also, also to add to that, um, I, I told a friend of mine some years back and um, he, he said to me, so um, yeah, you guys are moving to Canada. I said, yes. I said, why? I said, the truth is, unfortunately, the UK is not immigrant friendly. Yeah. Yeah. The system is such that it doesn't um, give immigrants that opportunity to, to, right, do, well to do well in so certain, 
in certain jobs. I'll give you an example. I did my postdoc in the in the UK, um, and um, there was an opening in another university. I'm not going to mention the name, and um, I got spoken to um, the principal investigator after some months of sending in my application. And she said to me, Alex, unfortunately, um, I wish I could give you this position, but I can't. Reason being, you're not from the EU. Hmm. She said, you're qualified, you have everything I need, but unfortunately, you're not from the EU. And I thought to myself, I've been here for over 10 years. Um, contributed so much, you know. Um, though we were students, my wife was studying then. I had done my own studies then, and I mean, so so I try to say that I don't have any value to add. And yeah, so it, basically, it's not a very immigrant-friendly sort of system. Um, others will beg to differ from what I've just said, but. I, I had to tell myself the hard truth. And there were certain um, encounters I had even um, in some of the places I worked at. Nice people, but it's the system, the system itself. Thanks for sharing that. That's heavy, heavy to share. Yep, I know. <laughs> but um, we've all been there. Mm. So we've all been there. What advice then do you have for newcomers to Canada? You need to come in here ready to learn ready to work hard and ready to give it everything it takes so don't come with a mindset they are coming to make money because the system isn't designed for you to make money it's designed for you to be looked looked after but not necessarily to see the dollars floating in your bank account here and there <laughs> no and that doesn't happen abroad so come with a mindset that you would have to do a lot to make yourself relevant. And don't wait until you come in. You start to prepare, immediately you decide you want to yeah. migrate. Start taking courses, start looking for people who have excelled, start looking at their profiles, start looking at what they had to do to excel, not just the success stories, but how did they get there? What ropes did they have to climb? What courses did they do? Did they have to learn a second language to do well in your area of specialization? For example, if you're coming here to do customer service, Canada is a bilingual country. So to do well, you need to be able to speak both languages mm -hmm. because if you're to do customer services, you could get calls from Quebec, but you're, you reside in Alberta. So you stand better chances of getting a job if you can speak both languages, a customer service job, for example, than someone who speaks only English or only French. So look at the bigger picture. Just don't think about the money as the primary driver of why you want to like i've seen um a few people who just tell me ah one dollar to 382 oh i'm just going to walk in there and i'll make 2500 when i change that to naira that's almost one million naira oh that's a lot of money and then you waltz in here and then you have to pay bills upon bills and you're left with minus at the end of the month <laughs> Because you came in with the mindset that you will just run 36 hours and then whatever you have should be enough. So people need to count the costs before you migrate. Look at expenditures as well. How much do I need to live comfortably every month? What do I need to do to get a job that's able to sustain me every month? Don't just look at the dollar equivalent in Naira or in Lira or whatever currency it is you're coming in from. Yeah. I, I, and I think one, one key thing is to be practical very practical um when you're coming in right you've made that decision right um aside from you know just getting in you should prepare yourself mentally right there are prices to be paid there are sacrifices to be made mm. and that's one story people don't tell others yes right it's and it not, may be rocky initially it may be rocky right but it's only going to get better it's only going to get better. I always like to encourage myself with that, right? Um, so firstly, okay, I decide I want to relocate, good. Um, what fields do you want to settle in? Do you want to continue with your current field? Do you want to go somewhere else? Okay, you make that decision. What do I need? Um, do I need to do additional courses? Yes. 
what are the courses I need to do. You identify those. Other courses I can do online. There are lots of courses you can do online. You've got lots of free resources out there. You've got Udemy. You've got different area, um, different websites you can visit, mm -hmm. right? Then networking. Networking is key. In Canada, right? in Canada. So it's always um, based on what sort of references you get and who mm -hmm. you know. So your network should be good. So if you are in my field, for example, you have to get your LinkedIn up to spec, right? Um, make sure it's clean. Um, make sure you actually have the right networks. Look for people in your field. Um, look at their, their, their qualifications, um, what sort of um, key skill sets they have. And this is information you can even get from job sites. Mm. And with all of these, you can actually build your capacity, review your resume, Get yourself ready. So when you hit the ground, you you have something really substantial to work with, and also get ready to um, at times do certain jobs, right? You never planned to do, right? It's to me, I just view that as a sacrifice, because you've got the target in front of you. Yeah. So yeah. It, it if you have. Um a structured plan in place that period of doing what you don't really like would only be a very short one mm -hmm. but if you know what you're doing you can then move on to what it is you really planned to do it, from the it, onset it's, it's all about planning but don't come here and then sit down and wait for that dream job to show up it doesn't work like that around here it's, it's actually a process if you think about yeah it. it's a process it's the go, reality yeah, yeah you have to go through a process and that's something some people back home don't understand. Okay, I have a PhD, I have a master's, I have um, an MSc, MSc in blah, blah, blah. And if I come in, definitely I'll get a job. I'm super qualified. No, it doesn't work that way, right? Mm. I, we're fortunate to have gotten a job even before landing, but we had to connect with the right people, ask the right questions, meet the right people, get the right resources. And with, with that, that was able to give us preferably like a soft landing, mm. right? And th then get into the system, get integrated, and you move ahead. So I think the place of mental preparation is mm. really key. People have to prepare mentally. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to add is that um, we have situations in Nigeria where somebody has a master's in engineering where he works in the bank. So his work experience isn't necessarily um, matched with his academic qualifications. So in that kind of case, I'd advise you to get some qualifications that um, match with your experience, since you really don't have any experience in your primary field, or be ready to start from scratch in what your field was before. But don't come here with Yoruba education and be hoping to teach because <laughs> the requirements <laughs> to be a teacher in Canada are not the same as just saying, oh, you read education. Okay, we are short of teachers here. <laughs> We're going to employ you. I'm a teacher for I'm my a teacher. <laughs> so I see people who say, oh, they've said that they find teacher for Canada. Oh, and they go Canada. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then they get into Canada and they are waiting for that dream job of becoming a teacher. But it isn't like that. There are steps. There are qualifications. And some of know? these guys have, have have the the Canadian experience or the yeah. Canadian qualifications yeah. that get some jobs. So, like, there are people who want to teach in Canada that don't realize that you actually need to get your teaching license from Nigeria, and then they can give you an equivalence here. But if you don't have a teaching license from Nigeria, even if you have a degree in education, nobody's going to employ you to teach anything here in Canada. So make sure that you do your research and understand what it is you're coming here to do and what it will take to succeed in what you want to do. Don't make any assumptions. If not, assumptions will get you in serious trouble. So in fairness to the Canadian government, I will say that there are 1,001 resources that they have provided, mm -hmm. especially when they decide that they are picking you from the pool. You know, like they get you on the, um, the job, what's it called now? The job bank, job mm -hmm. bank yeah. as well. So I'll say maybe they can do more to spread some of that information in other languages in a bit to present Canada as the best country in the world. 
they don't really tell the stories of people who had to work hard initially, like the rough journey, the first year when you're doubting if you made the right decision and all of that. I feel like they need to feature more of these stories in different languages so that people don't have the, the wrong notion about you just coming in and everything just works with you doing nothing. So they need to do more in pushing some of those realistic stories, not just, oh, I came to Canada and it's been so nice and I got a job in two weeks, but there are people who mm. didn't get jobs for three months, six months. So they need to tell those stories and then end it with the success of how they finally succeeded in the system. But they need to stop hiding some of the um, challenging aspects. Yes, the struggles of settling in. And I think and I think that's why I love what Dunce is doing because yeah. this is actually a very it's a wonderful resource to showcase to showcase people's exactly. stories and their journey people's reality the reality and exactly. you know, not many people tell you the truth of what they go through one of the most difficult questions i ask is have you ever been at the back end of implicit bias or unconscious bias or outright racism so tell tell us about that what that was like and what you did uh, that's that's um uh, i'll say so one the, yeah okay the the what here by virtue of my job right um i tend to work with different people from different um different parts of the world and one of the things i've learned to develop over time is having a tough skin and then um, whether you like it or not right you're black i'm african right and um certain people tend to relate with you based on your skin color and not the qualities that you actually possess, right? And it can be quite difficult. And But um, in the midst of that, I think the place of um, having your self-dignity intact, right, and being strong goes a long way and reminding yourself that you have value right? My value is not based on what you say and being able to stand up for yourself when you need to. It can be difficult, but standing up for yourself when you need to. Um, I'll give an example. When, when we're in the UK, I remember a church that we, we um, actually fellowshiped with. And um, it's so funny, you get into the church, there are three different sections, don't see, right? There's a section for the British people that are white. There's a section for mixed races. There's a section for the blacks. An unconscious- um, um, An unconscious divide. Selection. Oh, yes. divide, yeah. Right? And once you walk in, you look at the three, where do I belong? That's the first thing that comes to your mind. And you just go to where you see your fellow African brothers and sisters. And these are people you fellowship with. And after service, you meet them in the city center, right? Some of them just assume they don't know you from Adam. No, not, they don't assume, they pretend. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know you from Adam. I mean, I, I've experienced it not once, not twice. My wife, I think um, she will tell you her experience in that, in that angle. And um, if, if you're not careful, you then have that conception that everyone around there is the same. Yes. But when we relocated from Lancaster down to Cambridge, down south, um, you have more people from different parts of the world. And I remember the first, the church we finally decided to attend. I remember going for um, one of the services and the very first, I think the first two services and one of the guys in front turned around and looked at me and said, so how, how are you doing? How was your week? I actually had to turn behind me because I felt he was speaking to someone behind me. So seriously, don't see. I turned around and I said, seriously, you're speaking to me? And that was how, that, that was a level to which that got into. And um, if you're not careful, you then tend to feel everyone is the same, but being able to come out of it and remind yourself and give yourself that conscious reassurance that I am not what people think I am. And being able to stand and speak is important. Yeah. Yeah. So in my own case, I'll, I'll speak about something different. I'm, I'll talk to speak about um, 
a workplace experience. So the thing is in the UK or in Canada. Oh, here in Canada. Canada. Here in Canada. One of the places I had worked. So um I had worked there for three months at the time this young man came in. He had a BSc and both thing and you know, oh I can use R. Oh, oh I heard you are the one here that uses R. Oh, I'm sure I can uh show you one or two things, you know, as the time goes on. And I smiled and I sat down and looked. And so there was a task to do. And um, he was asked to assist me because more or less like, uh, I don't know. And I had waited for that opportunity to help show him that I may be black, but mentally I'm not different from any other professional in my field. You're brilliant, you're experienced and seasoned. <laughs> yes. So what I did was um, I gave him the script. Okay, you go and write this bit of this script in R. And let me know when you're done. And he brought back the script and it had uh, 3,000 lines. <laughs> now, the thing with scripting is that you need to do some nesting sometimes to summarize the steps so that you can then work with loops. But because he had learned some basic script writing and didn't know all of that, so I told him, when you're free, let me know and then I'll uh, go through this with you. And that was how I was able to show him that you don't make assumptions about black people that they are empty headed and they just got a degree somewhere from the market or something you know so for me that was how i dealt with it. i dealt with it by showing him professionally that look i am no spring chicken i've been doing this for many years so those are these kind of um, racism experience in the workplace where people just assume that because of your skin color you should be down there in the food chain somewhere and mm -hmm. they should be up there and, and most times, just to, just to interject, that most times they actually bring it subtly, right? Yeah. Right. Um, like, oh, um, can you can you do that? Um, can you fix this? Like, excuse me, seriously. You see my resume, right? You this see is, my resume, right? That's the reason why I was employed right? to begin with. Um, so why so, are you assuming that so, I can't? So action to me speaks <laughs> louder than words, right? So put the stuff out there and oh that's so nice how did you do it <laughs> interesting right yeah. so you, you have to go out of your way to prove your worth and at the same time i like i said earlier you have to know your value don't allow anyone to pull you down i i i i do not take lightly to people coming to speak down on me right and you should be able to stand up and say no. Yeah, without being rude without being or rude being confrontational. Or confrontational? No, sorry, that's that that's a no no. You don't go there. Don't go there. That's yeah. wrong. And you correct people politely. If um, he or she doesn't listen to you, go through the proper channel. If you need to go to your through your human resource department go ahead and do that yeah but don't because i find out that sometimes we tend to just let, receive receive yeah. let it slide let it slide yeah. until it implodes in your face and, and you then of, react yeah, one of those days you explode like a time bomb and you say certain things you'll regret so why not handle it as soon as it happens that's that's my motto that's so true and then with technical stuff like yours people can pretend their way into um, hours or pythons, right? So that actually <laughs> he gives you an edge um, there. Yeah. So it, you're right, and it's important what you said about um, some of these um, encounters that you have, it builds up, right? And if you're mm. not careful, if you're not able to manage your emotions, you can actually blow up. Yes. Um, and I was close to doing that, um, at some point in my career, in my life, and I, I realized I needed to step back before I get to that point. I needed to take care of myself. So then that leads to my last question. What do you do for self-care? Because the Black community right now is suffering, um, especially mm. with this racism that we hear every day. Um, it's almost in your face now. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's writing about it. What then? do you do to take care of yourself so that you don't end up blowing up? We like to take um, breaks when we can. 
Um, and there are, there are little things you could do um, to take some time off and you know, get the edge, the edge off. Um, a good example, like uh, was it yesterday, we decided to have our, our weekly, ops, weekly meeting ops meeting on the, on deck, the deck upstairs. So uh, the yeah. sun was out the sun anyway. Was out. Lovely day, sunshine, you know, get the best of life, fresh air. You know, that helps, you know, and yeah. um, take lots of walks when you can. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And church has also been very good. Yeah. yeah. So I also feel um, mental self care. One of the things we've done is to connect with people who are like minded. Mm -hmm. We may not be in each other's faces all the time, but once in a while, you know, just having some of those discussions with people who are like minded. Like -minded. I'm not saying now that we just go randomly and associate with people, people who are really like-minded because not everybody sees some of the challenges that you do. So we do that. And then also we like to drive around, but COVID hasn't been fair. So we haven't really done that recently, but just yeah. explore your neighborhood, explore your environment. There's so much of beauty. I hope to get back to where we were before COVID, walking around and all, mm -hmm. but we'd enjoy driving, change of scenery, I guess because our background is in surveying and geoinformatics. So in Nigeria, they would say Agwe Pool. You know, we're used to <laughs> going around into rural areas. Yeah. So we're, we're cultivating that culture here in Canada as well. And Canada is so lovely. When it yeah, there's so much to see in so Canada. Much to see. Especially in rural Alberta. Yeah, rural just, Alberta, just, I just love just going there. Yeah, yeah. Just take a drive. Uh, and people are friendly, but now yeah. with COVID, you have to be careful. And another, well, physically, one thing I love to do is uh, recently I've been pulling him along. Just go for a good pedicure that comes with a massage. <sighs> Sit down. Yeah, I, I, had, I had my first encounter. <laughs> it was actually nice. Yeah, it's, it's soothing, yeah. it's relaxing yeah. and distressing yeah. in its own way. Yeah. And another thing I have on the, on the menu for the future when COVID goes away is the saunas. You know, go and get some steam and sweat like uh, you would not do in Canada normally. Wow, what wonderful, rich stories, Jockey and Alex. Thank you so much for joining me and for being a part of this important project, really, for Africans living abroad.